Hello and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench we have something gigantic and huge from the Tektronics company of the 50s, 60s vintage. We have a Type 585 plug-in based scope. I've done a lot of videos on the 7000 series which is kind of what this grew into. And they did keep the plug-in modules. Now the scope is not on, has not been powered up, and not tested. I haven't even cleaned it yet. It is absolutely filthy and needs to be cleaned up. The plug-ins, the scope is off, so this is safe to come out. These pop out. And we have a scope that is vacuum tube-based. There are some transistors in here as well. But we have some pretty wild construction in one of these. There is a ton of adjustment points, lots of things to line up. But this was about the top of the line when it came to scopes of the day. and the 585 being one of the faster variants. I have a smaller one, which doesn't have a plug-in, which is right here. We have a 310A for size comparison between the two. 310A is about as big as a 7603, so this scope is massive, and there is a ton of gravity in here too. It weighs a bunch. Um, this does not have a separate power supply. Some of the 500 series scopes that you'll run into possibly do have a second box that is the power supply. We do have one of those destined for the channel as it is here ready to be rebuilt. These 500 series scopes were built to be incredibly dependable and they needed to be for the price that they commanded in the 50s and 60s. Ton of tubes in here, ton of time. This one I believe has distributed plate or um, distributed vertical to get the bandwidth. This is derated because it's an A model. So the 585 was 100 megahertz vacuum tube scope. The 585A derated down to 80, which isn't too terrible um, considering that the 310 is. Um, 10 megahertz, if I remember correctly, and the HP scope that we looked at in a prior video, which is currently sitting over there, is 600 kilohertz. So, plenty of bandwidth. We'll take a look at this thing. We've got, we're going to have silicon, silicon, ceramic wafers throughout. We're going to have all kinds of construction techniques. The tech used back in the day, uh, we are going to have to use a special solder if any components need to be swapped out because the ceramic strips that are in these scopes are sensitive to non-silver bearing solder. And not using the correct solder with a high silver content can pop the uh, connections off the ceramic strips. Going to give this scope a really, really good clean and then we're going to let it tell us what it needs. We're not going to go crazy and redo the whole thing. A lot of the parts in this time were hand-picked, hand-processed, and dialed in. If there's anything that truly is faulted out and we can confirm there's a fault, we'll go ahead and replace it. We will probably need to clean a lot of the controls. This was stored in a not great environment, and it is very dusty, and some of the controls are crunchy and things like that. But look at the tuning. This is just the tuning on the input which is kind of incredible. Every single one of these is a tunable capacitor. So some of this stuff is going to be very sensitive to cleaning and um, will need to be have some care taken. You can't just dunk one of these plug-ins in, um, in an ultrasonic cleaner. Although there is a cleaning procedure for these 500 series scopes, which does involve pressure washing them out with a <laughs> uh, with a low pressure pressure washer but hopefully we don't have to go that far on this one 
There is also a military style decontamination procedure for these that was used during the nuclear program to decontaminate these for radiation. Uh, that was officially written by tech for the U.S. Looks like this plug-in at least comes to us from the Yale University Physics Department. And we have an old ID number. I did not get it directly from Yale. It's probably changed hands a number of times since then. We'll also take a look and see what a Type 82 plug-in does. Is It's a dual-channel plug-in, but I don't know what the bandwidth is. The most ubiquitous plug-in that was made for the 500 series was the CA. So I'll have to figure out what a Type 82 is. The Type 82 is the 85 megahertz plug-in, so this is actually well matched for the frame. We also have a couple of the more exotic plug-ins to go through. We have a Type W, which I am very much looking forward to getting online and being able to use with this scope. Maybe with the other 500 series scope that we have queued up for the bench. And the just the plug-in was $1,000 in 1972 money. So just the plug-in is $7,400 in 2023 money, which is kind of bonkers. So that, exp that also explains why there's so much tuning up here at the inputs, because... 85 megahertz at this time period was really pushing these components to their absolute limits to get the bandwidth, which is some of the reasons why they had to derate down to um, 85 megahertz as opposed to 100. We do have, I just saw it, here is a new Vister tube. So hopefully we don't have problems with those. That could be a little bit problematic, but we'll work on that. Do we even have gear-driven attenuators for the attenuator switch? They will need some servicing. They do look a little dry, or I should say dried out over time. But they're still in good shape. Teeth aren't sheared off or anything crazy like that. Everything's good. So this does not look too bad. <laughs> we'll clean the face up, give it a good wipe down. We're going to bring it up very slowly on a Variac, the isolation transformer in the current limited supply. Make sure it's all set and ready to go. This one's going to be a minimal. We're going to do just enough to get it up into spec because I do want to keep this as original as possible. So we're going to do just enough to get it passing specification. And hopefully we don't have to do too much more. Holy cow, the front panel of this thing was absolutely filthy. Looks so much better now that it's just slightly clean. That looks way better just with a quick cleaning. I still need to take care of the sticker residue right here. That was a sticker of non-consequence, just an old calibration ticket that had faded and had no writing on it because it was so old. While I was cleaning up the knobs, I did notice we have trace rotation in that's why there's a hole here. There's a potentiometer for trace rotation. We have astigmatism, intensity, scale, illumination, and focus. So we have the three, four critical controls for a scope, which is nice. Missing a uh, nut on the front panel. We'll pull this off right now. This, I don't know if this is glass or plastic, but it needs to be cleaned. Well, our uh, light band from the Draticule lights. No, that is the front of the tube. That is glass. Okay. So we'll get this cleaned up because this really needs to be cleaned. That Draticule, I don't know if that's faded in the sun or not, but I can read it, but it is very faint in there. So much dirt came off the front panel. It's looking really good. Uh, I still need to do the case. It's still dusty, but we're ready to apply power.
All right, it's looking really, really good. I'm ready to start the power-up process for this, so I'm going to take this from zero to line voltage over the course of maybe an hour or so. It's going to be it's going to be a long time spooling this up slowly. It is it has been quite some time since this thing has seen any power, and I want to give it the best chance it can at life. So we're going to let that spool up, and then what we're going to do is I'll bring you guys back as long as nothing exciting happens. If something exciting happens, we'll talk about it. But I'll bring you guys back, and we'll hit it with line voltage and see what happens. Okay, well, nothing eventful happened over the last hour. So we've got 122 volts nominal on the line. We are going to hit the power button. Pilot light's on. So we dropped to 119 volts. What we're going to actually see, the scope is currently drawing about 400 watts, which this scope is power rated for 800 watts, which is kind of crazy. We're down to 360. In a minute, we should hear a click when the high voltage comes in. Right now, it's going through a preheat process, warming everything up. There's the click. We're up to 600 watts now. And we have signs of life. Look at this. Don't see anything on the screen just yet. Line triggering, A sweep, trigger sensitivity. Uh, this is probably going to be like the other scope where stable triggering doesn't happen for a while until it warms up, which is totally fine. Let's see here. We're on A only. That would be this. No. Let's switch down to B. Oh, no. Ah, we have... So we have some indicator lights up here that tell us if the, if the trace is on screen or off screen, which is fine. Let's kick it over to A. A is off screen and doesn't do anything. So it looks like we have an A problem with the A side of that plug-in. So we'll switch over to B. And I can do that. So... Nope, we're not quite sweeping yet. Now it looks like we're sweeping. There we go. We have a trace. All right. Ooh, nice, nice pencil thin trace. Oh, wrong side. That looks really, really good. B side seems to be working. Our A side, I don't think this position. Oh no, 1x gain. Yeah, that this pot may be having some trouble. All right, so we have it on 5 volts per centimeter, so it would be 5 volts per division. So let's throw some actual signal at this and see what happens. We'll use some tube gear to test some tube gear. Ah, uh, that looks good. Wow, our viewing window is very limited on this particular unit. That might be because of the speed. Oh, you know what? It helps if I actually tell it to trigger. I was trying to get it to trigger off the line, which is not going to work. Well, huh. 
Okay, this trigger pot is going to need some help. If I just breathe on it, it loses lock. So the trigger circuit's trying, but also we can see the pot's not stable. It's fluttering. I'll turn this up a little bit so the camera can see it. It's fluttering. So the trigger itself isn't quite stable yet. But if I move the trace off the screen, I can actually go off the screen, which is actually part of how the tube is made. So my only useful area is the center four centimeters of the screen. But we're pushing the tube quite hard. This scope does have distributed vertical deflection. So there's a lot of space inside the envelope that's taken up by the deflection plates, especially in the vertical for such a high bandwidth. It's one of the things that the uh, lower bandwidth scopes actually get you. They get you more tube area because you don't have um, so many structures inside the bulb. So I really can't complain about that. This thing's working really, really well. For not being restored, just turning on, not cleaning all the controls, doing all that stuff, just kind of seeing if it works. So we have signs of life, which is fantastic. Um, Wonder why it's double triggering when I have it set to B only. Oh, the variable works. Alternate mode works. Oh. That's the gain control. That switch is crusty. All right, so some of our problems may be frame. Some of our problems might be plug-in related. Because we know for sure A doesn't work. It's trying to, but this uh, variable volts per centimeter is quite cranky. Yeah, and it's thrown off the top of the screen. We did just lose the fuse. It was not the fuse that went. Looks like the fan decided to stop. When I powered this up, it was running, and it was fairly free spinning. So, what happened? Because this was, uh, it was running all right. When um, I did the power on test via the, oh no, oh, that's not, that's not happy. Oh, that fan shaft locked up. Let's get that blade off of there. Oh, that motor is really hot. Hopefully the coils aren't cooked. If they are, we'll just have to grab another motor. These are 110 volt induction motors with They're 110 volt motors, so they are not awful. Well, we've got a situation where the fan has welded itself. I just heard a click, so the thermal cutout just opened. 
So the fan has welded itself to the shaft and will not come off. So what I got to try to do is there's one holding point, there's another, and there's another. Should be able to get that bolt out and then bring the fan forward so I can work on it outside the scope. Let's see if we can do that. Well, that was pretty dumb. Don't try to take the fan out of the shroud. Just take the whole fan shroud off. Gains perfect access to the bearing oil holes, which is what we needed. They're hiding down there. We'll get some oil put on there. I'm going to move the fan by hand manually. See if we can't get these bearings freed up. Oh, uh, what was what's that? That's crusty. I do not know what that came from. We'll figure it out, I'm sure. But we'll get some oil on these and uh, get this thing going again. All right, these fan bearings are completely shot, so we're going to see if we can't clean them and bring them back. It's a long shot, but it might work. My fan connection is here, third one in, and sixth one in off of the main power transformer, which is up here. So we have to get out the soldering gun and get these desoldered. The ceramic strip does need special silver bearing solder. We're using a high silver alloy. And we'll get on this and get it finished. Or at least get the fan out so we can really work on it uh, with the scope off the bench and crank on this fan. Okay, well, I was disassembling the fan for a rebuild potential of said fan. And that is going to be a no. These aren't ball bearings in the traditional sense as we see today. These are these are a I think this is brass. But we have a brass bulb that sits in the bearing like so. So that sits in there and then it rides on an oil soaked felt which we can see right here. There's a little bit of copper inside. But that does give it some play this way. That's normal, but a ball bearing wouldn't do that. You would have no play in these directions. It would only, it would sit, well, there'd be a little, but not too much. So rebuild potential on these. When I took this apart, I was assuming it was going to be a destructive teardown, and it was a very destructive teardown. So uh, rebuild potential on these particular bushings, I guess, uh, is slim to none. The covers are pressed into the, into the metal. There's a lip here, and this dust cover is, is put on with a press, so these do not come off easy at all. Actually, the bottom one's holding on way better than the top one. The top one came off pretty easy, but this is what I got on the top. There wasn't much there except for the ring that held the dust cover down. Here's the impeller. Nice big copper chunk on that one. This is actually in pretty good shape. If I could find some bearings in a cage that fits it, this is reusable. Pretty sure the coil is still good. Coil's in good shape as well, but uh, those bearings are toast. There's not much left. There's a ton of grit that got in there from storage. And that fan is not going to run much anymore. The rubber on the shock mounts for the fan is very degraded. If I do find a fan that fits the bolt pattern and spins fast enough and has an appropriate shaft size that I could mount this propeller to it, or this fan to it. I guess it's not a propeller. It uh, doesn't go in the water, but it is a fan. Um, we'll be able to rebuild this scope. This is a very common 115 volt fan not a huge deal for um, getting a replacement very early shaded pole motor the physical dimensions are going to be the problem there I have to get the right shaft size the right wattage fan so it spins the fan fast enough to cool the scope the scope needs a ton of cooling and one that doesn't come with a side of sand in the bearings so, at this point, we're going to have to call it. Um, I have to put this restoration on pause until I source a fan. 
or find a modern replacement. So if you know of any modern replacements, hit me up in the description below and we'll see what we can get going. Well, it seems like the 555 video went live on YouTube and there was a great outpouring of support for the 500 series scopes that I have here in the lab. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I was really bummed about the tube as well. I really don't like giving up on stuff and things like that. But I got some great news because the whole purpose of the 555 was to have a W plug-in. Bandwidth wise, didn't get me excited. The W plug-in did for its compensation voltage. I have much better bandwidth scopes than a 555. They top out at 30 megahertz. This is a 585. The fan in this, the bearings were completely trashed. They were gone. So I ended up creating this, which absolutely does not work. This is terrible. This worked really well. Uh, I managed to drill a couple extra holes, and I got a bathroom fan in there. This fan is a shaded pole induction motor as well, and it draws an amp and a half. Because it draws an amp and a half, I had it wired a little differently. We had it wired directly to the plug and the switch because it's 110, 110, and the fan spun up. That was the first problem. The second problem is this fan has this type of impeller on it. This is a turbine impeller, and it does not work in this application. I knew it wasn't going to in the start. I just wanted to see if it would fire up and spin. It did, and it did keep the scope from going into overheat and faulting out. However, I did not let it run that long due to the fact that this was not really moving air around the scope. Uh, this type of impeller pulls air in and throws it out to the side, so it was throwing a ton of air right around this ring, just enough to keep the thermal fuse cold and wasn't really pushing air through the scope. So I needed a different type of impeller. And I found a plastic impeller that was going to give me a little bit smaller, but it was going to spin a lot faster. This is the impeller that comes with the fan. Nice metal piece, very solid and wonderful. Has a very odd shaft diameter for today. So, did not fit on this shaft diameter. So I was like, okay, well, this is a seven inch fan. I ordered a six inch, uh, six blade fan and was hoping I could just pop this plastic piece off, pop the new impeller on. But look at the shaft size. There's no way that fan is gonna fit this shaft. It just is not gonna work. Um, so, I got really irritated and launched the fan and moved on to a couple of extra projects that I needed to get done that were time sensitive. Uh, these 500 series scopes were not time sensitive. Bearing position, pretty well centered on here, so I was pretty happy with that. However, I wasn't happy with the rest of it, which is fine because we're about to change that because... This is the fan from the 555, and we know this works. I had this one rebuilt and fired up. So this fan's been nice and oiled, and the bearings are in good shape. So we're going to use this one, and we're going to use that one to replace this one. But the shrouds are different. This has the cut shroud. That one has the full shroud. Same size fan, same size blades, different shroud. So what I need to do is I need to pop this centerpiece out and replace it with the other fan. I'm going to use the centerpiece and the supports from the other, from the 555 fan, because these uh, rubber bushings have seen better days, and this is getting ready to kind of disintegrate. So I'm going to do that real fast, which shouldn't take too long. It's just a couple of bolts. And then we'll wire this fan up, see if we don't have a scope. All right, and after setting everything back up again, we have fan spin. All right, let me put the bolts back on and covers back on, and then we'll let this thing do some burn-in testing. Okay, I've got a little bit of a uh, signal coming in, triggering level centered, set to AC. Let's see what we got. Well, I'm not going to complain about that. Um, the 585 looks like it may be up and kicking. I do know this Type 82 has quite a bit of problems in it. And there are some things on it 
that uh, that's part of the vertical in the Type 82. And also this scope hasn't warmed up yet. So I'm going to let it warm up. Just make sure it doesn't go lose its mind now that it's not going to kick off for overheating. And it does have proper airflow. That fan is putting out a substantial amount of air coming around the uh, chassis. But the trigger's nice and stable, which is good. Vertical's not. Vertical's jumping around a little bit. But that's also some noise in the uh, potentiometers and a couple of other things. So the plug-in is struggling. But uh, I was told that there's a Type 81 that will adapt the 585 to take the older style plug-in. So we can use some of the slower plug-ins with the faster scope. Really looking forward to getting that. Uh, I was able to dig one of those up. Not in the lab, but it is on the way. And uh, we're going to, so a little bit of future foreshadowing in the videos as to what's going to come across the bench. This is some of the problem with this guy is once it starts warming up, it does have a bit of a trigger issue. Um, not 100% sure where that is yet, but it could be just a uh, potentiometer needs to be cleaned. could be a little bit deeper than that. Maybe a cap starting to stress or something like that. But when it's flickering like that, that is a trigger problem. So this particular scope uh, was exhibiting that issue, but it was exhibiting that issue when it got really hot. But if I turn the stability up, we get it back. So, but I definitely have something a little janky in the trigger path that we'll have to look at, but that will be in a future video. So all in all, another step forward to getting a 500 series scope up and going in the lab. I really think it might be the stability switch. Because if I turn it off, turn it back on. Yep, something in the trigger circuit. So we will work on that. Thanks for stopping by the lab and taking a look at this 585. More videos on this particular scope will be on the way. We will continue to press forward until we have a functioning scope. Got through a lot of the hurdles on this so far, but it's still a little bit more to go. If you like what you're seeing and you would like some more content, take a look at the Patreon page. Patreons are running about five videos ahead. Everything will eventually come up to YouTube, but their support helps keeps the, light, keeps the lights on here in the lab and the videos coming. So, as always, more is always on the way, and I will see everybody in the next video. Bye for now.